good evening to the in studio audience and good day to all of you who are joining us virtually from around the globe i understand that there are more than 600 registrants from 17 countries who registered to this 125th anniversary celebration of the faculty of medicine of the university of colombo i am pleased that in a very short period of time we were able to put together this virtual international conf medical conference on medical education as it were to highlight and showcase how the medical education in sri lanka has benefited not only in sri lanka but also nations and populations around the world i'd like to begin by welcoming the vice chancellor of the university of colombo senior professor chandrika vijayaratna who has joined us this evening welcome to you madam i would also like to welcome professor indika karuna tilaka the president of the sri lanka medical association who in a very short period of time put together this conference thank you indika and welcome i would like to also welcome the in studio audience that we have today here we have uh, several past deans the immediate past dean professor jennifer perera professor rohan jayasekara professor sanat lama badusuria as well as chair and senior professors of the faculty as well as alumni who are here today i know that from around the world alumni representing various specialties various um, countries and of course various branches of the professional associations have joined this uh, webinar or the web uh, web, a web conference and i'd like to welcome all of you uh, to the, to the, today's event now the celebrations began this morning with a commemorative um, event in the faculty of medicine i'm sure some of you would have joined that in person as well as virtually i have been told by the web team that we had uh, more than 22000 participants from across the globe participating virtually in the morning uh, morning um, uh, events so we are very happy to have at this <coughs> time of great strife in the world because of the covid pandemic that we were able to reach you virtually and perhaps um the opportunity created by the pandemic enabled us to reach a wider audience than that of what we would have uh, reached if we uh, on an ordinary time so with those a uh, little words i would like to once again welcome all of you uh, to this conference and i hope that you would have an enjoyable conference thank you very much thank you <laughs> professor ajit chanaika the dean faculty of medicine colombo today is a historic day for us we are celebrating 150 years of the colombo medical school and in this historic occasion we are going to launch a collection of material the archival material of historical value that was compiled by professor r a jaykodi 
This material ranged from 1870 to 1960. I would like to invite Professor Lal Jayakodi to hand over and present this historic collection of documents of the faculty to the Dean of the Faculty, Professor Vajit Vithanayaka, and the Vice Chancellor, Professor Chandrika Nuchiratna. Professor Jayakodi, please. Professor Jayakoti would like to say a few words about this value of the valuable contribution. You can just yes, okay. This is Anju Kavidera, Vice Chancellor, University of Colombo, Dr. Vajra Disnayaka, Professor Vajra Disnayaka, Dean, Faculty of Medicine, uh, former deans of the faculty, uh, emeritus professors. Uh, senior professors, professors, uh, distinguished invitees, alumni, ladies and gentlemen. At the outset, let me thank uh, Dr. Vajira for uh, giving me a slot to make this uh, presentation of my compendium at this, uh, at this function. I'm ever so grateful to him. I think uh, uh, you will remember that uh, as part of the 150th anniversary celebrations, I think in the January, February period, the faculty had an International Medical Congress. The publication committee at that time requested, uh, and there was a, a publication out of that uh, function, and the publication committee requested me also to write on two or three areas for that publication. When I went to the literature at that time, it is there that uh, it conceived on me that maybe that I should do this sort of uh, work. I think when I went into try to find the literature, I found that uh, we, where we would expect actually most of these documents are not available, right? Uh, like the National Archives or the Museum Library, etc. I think. Uh, some of those documents now, like for example, if you read uh, Dr. Prisura Goda's uh, publication, either the history of medicine document, a book, or the uh, public uh, article in the 125th anniversary celebration, he talks about uh, the university calendars, prospectors in 1870, beyond. None of those are available now. Actually, the earliest I could lay my hands on is the uh, 1910 like so. So with this background, let me, permit me to read my preface for this, uh, this uh, compendium. It's not long. This year, 2020, the Faculty of Medicine University of Colombo, formerly the Ceylon Medical College, will celebrate 150 years. This institution, which started in 1870 as a medical school, was upgraded to the Ceylon Medical College in 1880. During that time, the medical college was administered as an arm of the medical services of the colony of Ceylon by the civil medical department, which was headed by the principal civil medical officer, abbreviated PCMO. Each year, the PCMO submitted an annual report which was incorporated into the administration report of the government of Ceylon. The coverage about the medical college in the annual reports of the PCMO was minimal as the PCMO report covered many other important medicine and health related issues of the colony. However, in certain years, the report of the registrar or the principal of the college was included in the PCMO report or it appeared as an appendix to the report. Such appendices contain more information about the college. The administration reports of the government of Ceylon are available for reference in the search room of the Department of National Archives, the Library of the National Museum, and a few other libraries. I could not find a complete set in any of these repositories. The reports are now 100 to 150 years old. While some of these documents are reasonably well preserved, Others are in various stages of disintegration and are perishing. 
the condition of some documents is such that they are not suitable for handling, let alone photocopying or scanning. Justifiably, the custodian sometimes do not make available such copies for reference. It is saddening to know that even some documents pertain to the latter half of the last century uh, also need restoration. It is likely that when the Ceylon Medical College celebrates its 200th anniversary in 2070, most of these documents may not be available to the reader. In this backdrop, I have endeavored to put together these documents titled A Compendium on the Ceylon Medical College in the Administrative Reports of the Government of Ceylon, 1870 to 1960. This compendium is for posterity. I believe that it will help the interested reader me, to get a glimpse of the subject or the researcher to get a head start. I also think that it will save a lot of time, effort and money as access to these old documents is always difficult. Although I have tried to be thorough in my search, it is possible that there may be, may be certain pieces of information that I have missed. I regret such omissions. I am pleased that I have been able to put together this compilation and present it to the Faculty of Medicine on the occasion of its sesquicentennial celebration. I have requested the Dean to have it in the faculty library for reference. Now, let, permit me to read what the 1870 what the principal civil medical officer wrote about the faculty, or the school rather. It comes in the uh, section called part four miscellaneous and under medical school. This is 1870 Ceylon administration report, Ceylon. Uh, this is what uh, the PCMO was a Dr. Charles Lee, Charles Lee, and this is what he wrote. <coughs> One great epoch has marked the year 1870 with regard to the civil medical department, which requires to be recorded. The governor, under what I humbly conceive to be most wise policy, sanctioned the inauguration of a medical school, and it was opened on the 1st June. As the period of this report extends only to the 31st of December, it will not be in place here to record the result of the first session. But there was a sufficient number of applicants to support the belief that the movement was not premature and to encourage and ho the hope that a great success would follow the efforts of the teachers. It is much to be desired that pure natives will avail themselves of this opportunity of acquiring medical knowledge on scientific principles. They will become available to the government as native vaccinators and trust, and I trust, in time, will supersede the ignorant weather are I have a firm belief that when the school is fairly established and its success ceases to be doubtful, the native element will come forward in abundance. The interest taken by the principal, Dr. Luce, and by the other lecturers in the school is sufficient proof that their duties will be carried on with energy to a successful issue. So thank you very much. This is what uh, the first principal, uh, the PCMO wrote. And I feel this is probably one of the first entries about this institution uh, written after it was inaugurated. So um, I'm, I'm happy that I have been able to collate this. Uh, this carries from 1870 to 1960. It is a, a, just a, a convenience. But I must, I regret that since this, we became part of the University of, uh, University of Ceylon in 1942, beyond that really the records are, records are um, uh, really very inadequate, very scanty. Maybe that, uh, and we, uh, our uh, section about the medical faculty came in under the section on uh, Department of Education. And I think uh, that's a very vast area and the sections on higher education are just one or two pages. And so information of our medical faculty is very, very small. So I think, but uh, I found certain uh, reports of the principals are very informative. So thank you, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Lal Jaikwadi, for that very valuable compendium and presenting this on this very historic day. Now I would like to invite Professor Chandrika and Vijay Ratna, the Vice Chancellor of the University of Colombo, for her welcome address. 
Hi, everyone. Uh, my revered teachers who are here as well as online, uh, former deans, fellow colleagues, and our young, energetic, enthusiastic, capable dean, Purita Vajira Disanayaka, and our moderator and organizer of this uh, very special virtual conference to celebrate our 150th birthday, which we had an entire series of activities uh, in the run up to this day, but sadly some of those had to be postponed due to Madam Corona. I don't know whether it's correct to say it's Madam or Mr, but <laughs> nevertheless. So let me begin by saying that at 150 years of maturity, which is a very great rarity for a medical school anywhere in the world. Our faculty, which began in 1870, is the undisputed mother of medicine in our island nation and the pioneer of fac faculty of medicine, which is a truly exceptional achievement. So no doubt we have inherent histories, traditions, attributes of this illustrious institution, which portrait wonderful education, research, and service, both in Sri Lanka and beyond. So no doubt, despite modern day confounders, some of which have turned out to be very useful today in this digital world, uh, we have had to adapt and change our educational focus appropriate to the ever-changing needs of the people of our country, our region, and the world. I must say that our faculty has not, never lost its luster. She has a proud history of providing a very conducive environment of both the learning, the art, and the science of medicine, and that too with meticulous precision. No doubt the expectations of, us, of our society and public from any institution of higher learning is that we inculcate this such an ethos of adopting the highest ethical norms and commitment to service underpinned with honesty and integrity. And I'm sure you will agree that our alumni, wherever they are, both in Sri Lanka and abroad, are the epitome of our profession. And therefore, some of our young lads and girls who I hope they are online, uh, undergraduates, should realize that they are they will be the considered benchmark, and indeed, we have to continue to be role models. So I salute everyone who has joined uh, this uh, virtual conference, as well as those who have passed on over the years, both as staff and as students of our faculty for their wonderful commitment. I must also say, with humility that being a vice chancellor of 18, this is the third vice chancellor from this faculty, and that too, uh, the previous vice chancellor was the late Professor Nandadasa Kodagoda from our faculty, and that was for the 125th year of our celebrations. So that was 25 years ago. So let's hope that the next vice chancellor is, does not have to wait another 25 years uh, from our faculty. But no doubt, we need to strengthen our scientific knowledge and practice with appropriate skills and particularly attitudes to serve the sick and the needy with devotion wherever they are in the world. So to our students and young graduates who must strive to live up to this name and be a valuable asset, I know you work hard not only for your exams but beyond and that we must not forget, and I'm sure none of us have forgotten, that the funding we have received, or even yet to receive, is in the midst of many competing national priorities. So at 150 years, this Sri Lankan treasure needs support, and I would like to reiterate that on her, this D-Day of her 150th birthday. So let us pay tribute to our pioneers, the long series of leaders, teachers, and the support staff. And I would like to congratulate you all to have put this wonderful program together and look forward to a very active 
and fruitful discussion in the few minutes to come. Thank you very much. Thank you, Madam Vice Chancellor. Uh, now, during the next symposium, we are going to connect up with our colleagues worldwide. And during this symposium, we'll be reflecting upon how the training that we have received from the Kalamu Medical School have molded their career and helped to reach worldwide and improve the health systems and the health in the, at the global level. I would like to invite my co-moderator, Professor Vajira Disanayaka, to introduce the first speaker. It gives me great pleasure to introduce to you Professor Dushanta Jayavira. He's known as Jaya to a lot of his friends, and uh, he is um, a distinguished alumnus of this faculty, who was previously the executive dean for research and research education, and currently professor in clinical medicine at the University of Miami Miller School of Medicine. Dr. Javira uh, has led and continues to lead numerous industry-funded trials on HIV, HIV, HCV, co-infection, and has published extensively. He was formerly the Associate Vice Provost for Human Subjects Research, overseeing the activities of the Ethics Committee. And on a personal note, I must mention that um, Professor Javira has been engaging uh, the Faculty of Medicine as well as Sri Lanka for the past several years. And due to his efforts, we were able to bring uh, online, um, uh, online um, uh, research ethics training to our country and through the city program of University of Miami, entire country's research ethics committee benefit, uh, ethics committees benefited uh, in the years nine, uh, 2016 to 2018. So it gives me great pleasure to invite um, Professor Javira to talk to us um, on um, his reflections on how education in Colombo Medical School molded his future and uh, brought him up to where he is today. Over to you, Jaya. <clears throat> Thank you. Thank you, Vajira. Uh, first of all, uh, I want to congratulate you. I've been uh, appointed as the new dean for the Colombo Medical School. Congratulations truly deserving of uh, your international figure. And uh, I want to thank uh, the Vice Chancellor and Professor uh, Karnathilaka for inviting me to reflect upon my uh, training in Sri Lanka and how it contributed to my, uh, to what I do in the United States. Uh, I don't want this to be about, you know, bragging about me, but it's about bragging about the medical school uh, because uh, uh, once you leave, Columbus, Sri Lanka, you suddenly realize what a valuable training and education you got there. Because it, when you're there, you sometimes take it for granted what you have. But when you leave, you realize it's almost like, you know, if you go through a divorce, sometimes you, when you think, oh my God, you know, why did I do that? It's something like that. You know, it's, it's kind of a, that kind of a loss that, you know, when you leave the country. So going back to the training, I vividly remember the amazing, the commitment of the faculty, starting from the basic sciences, like for anatomy, uh, we were with Lester Javadana, Bolsani Viratna, I know uh, Professor Jayakodi was with me in medical school and, uh, and Saroj was junior to me. And uh, we, we had such an intensive training and then one of the things that I really appreciated in Sri Lanka was that our free education and free healthcare, it gave us a foundation to treat everybody equally. It didn't matter whether they were the rich or the poor or they were the diplomats or the paupers, but we all treated people equally. And, and what really stuck me was that when we were students, how much interest the faculty, and not even the faculty, the people who were, who were, who were, who were professor, or who are the consultants in, in Colombo, uh, the, the general hospital, how much time they spent with us. It's amazing. We, we used to go to, uh, remember, Prof. Unit Ward 41 and, you know, and the subsequent uh, wards. The, the faculty spent so much time with us. 
And we felt so comfortable. And we were also trained by the, the trainees, like the registrars and the SHOs. They spent so much time on us. And I look back and say, my God, and all this was free. When you compare, for example, the University of Miami, uh, a standard, first of all, they had to do a bachelor's degree. They spent 200,000 uh, for the bachelor's degree. Then they go to the, do the uh, medical school, which will cost another 200,000. That's easily close to 400 to 500,000 expenditure to bring out a medical, uh, 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 successfully graduate a medical student. And I look back and say, my God, we all got this free. And so it is it absolute debt of gratitude that you develop towards your medical school for what you have got so much. So the things that I, the training that we got was sometimes maybe that we, we I mean, compared to the current medical curriculum that uh, we may have got uh, too much of basic sciences, but later on you realize that it's actually fundamentally important uh, because uh, when, we, when we did the medical school, we didn't have a basic science uh, four-year degree like in US, so you know, I'm just comparing with US. And, and in US, they expect you to have a complete uh, understanding of basic sciences by the time some of the basic sciences when they come to medical school, like biochemistry. And we managed to capture that in, in our medical school. So I'm very grateful uh, for, for the education I received. Now, when I come, came over here, I think what was really important was the postgraduate training that we got after qualifying. For example, I worked with Professor Viswanathan and Professor Gunatilaka and Professor Damadas. I mean, the, the training that they gave us, they were very strict. They were very strict. I mean, you know, we, we were nervous working with them, but we, we learned so much from them that reflected for our work ethic. So one of the things that it's well known in the United States. The Sri Lankan graduates have a very good work ethic and people uh, have no fear in hiring a Sri Lankan graduate to a medical school here in the US because they know that they, they have a good education and they, they have a good work ethic. How it helped me here is that currently I'm so busy with the COVID-19 uh, uh, pandemic. In fact, uh, I'm running, uh, just now I'm in the hospital waiting for my first infusion on a new drug called Avectadil, which is a vasoactive intestinal peptide. We are giving it to prevent, uh, prevent uh, cytokine storm. And, uh, and I'm in charge of multiple clinical trials as, as, uh, as Vajira mentioned. And that is entirely because of my training in Sri Lanka. I mean, uh, it's true enough, I trained in Chicago as a residence, as, as a, as a resident, but the real training, the fundamental uh, molding of my uh, work ethic and my dedication came from Sri Lanka. And I'm truly grateful to that. And, uh, uh, and currently that training has helped me to develop HIV research units. Uh, we have one of the largest research units uh, uh, in US for HIV because Miami is the epicenter for HIV. And uh, we have more NIH funding for HIV than any other specialty. And uh, then we have done quite well in hepatitis C. So now it's COVID-19. And but what I always look back and think of Colombo Medical School as the foundation for everything I have done in, uh, in my career. And I'm very grateful. And I don't want to take too much of my time. Uh, I didn't prepare any slides or anything because uh, I was just told, uh, Vajira said, you know, just be casual and say what, 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 what the, how my training benefited. I think the most important thing that I learned was that a solid foundation in the medical school, and we also learned critical thinking, uh, which, which helped quite a lot in my career. So therefore, I would want to conclude by saying that uh, there is there is so much that we owe to medical school that it is time for us to pay back. And I certainly will like to do that. And uh, 
uh, in, in many different ways. I have uh, discussed this with the dean and the, and the previous dean, uh, uh, and I will continue to do so. And I want to thank you for giving me the opportunity to share my views about my feelings about uh, Colombo and uh, medical school, and I'll be happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Professor Javira, uh, for those um, comments. Let's move on to the next uh, speaker, and we will, um, you know, take up questions uh, in the time that uh, that follows later on. So um, the next speaker is Professor Associate Professor Siri Kannangara. Uh, Professor Kannangara is uh, the director of the New South Wales Institute of Sports Medicine and senior rheumatologist at the Concord Hospital, uh, where he was um, uh, ex-head of department as well. Uh, he was um, the Olympic doctor to the Australian Olympic team uh, for the Barcelona and Atlanta Olympic Games, and is chief medical consultant uh, to Soccer Australia. Professor Kangarangara is also the FIFA Medical Committee representative for Oceania, and I know that um, in the formative um, years of uh, sports medicine in Sri Lanka in the 1990s, Professor Karnangara, together with uh, the likes of Professor Rohan Jayasekara and Dr. Ture Raja and Dr. Lalit Vijayaratna, played a very important role in uh, founding those programs here. And of course, uh, we've also known his contribution to the Sri Lanka cricket team uh, around that time and the time that we were riding very high in the world. So it gives me great pleasure to invite um, Professor Sri Karnangara uh, to make his remarks. Thank you, Vajira. Thank you very much for asking me to be present here tonight. It's tonight for me here in Sydney. Um, well, what I could say about the medical school in Colombo was it sort of gave us an all-round education. It was academia plus, it also made us play a certain amount of sports. And don't forget at some stage, uh, university were the cricket champions, the hockey champions, the Ture Raja's time, the basketball champions of the whole country. So we, we contributed not just as doctors, but also as sportsmen, um, which is also an education. And I can never forget what my medical school has taught me. I was brought up as a doctor on the three A's, the affability, availability, and ability. And, and these were so important. And as an undergraduate, I was brought up on the three G's, which was go and then uh, he has to be grateful. Gratitude was important. And finally, the generosity. Now, those three things were the basis of my education in that beautiful institution that I went through. Well, I think I'm the oldest guy here, but I see in the audience a few people who are my seniors and with respect to them. But I must say that the, 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 from the time I entered well, I entered the medical school wanting to have one hell of a good time. Sports was one of my most important things. I also did a bit of sport, did a bit of studies. So I managed to get there eventually. Um, and uh, so I, I must thank people like Dr. Da Samra Singh, Bhul Sanivirat, Professor Koch, Dr. Kote, uh, Professor Kote Gude, Dr. Dastri Artigale, uh, Prof. Lakvira Singh, Dr. Tanabalu Sundaram, Dr. Piris, Dr. Artigale, Professor Rajas Surya, and I have the pleasure of working with people like Dr. Oliver Piris. Well, he only retired a few years ago. He was my teacher. He is in Sydney, and I still meet him uh, fairly often. And Dr. Ranji Vikramanayaka. And of all people, I remember Professor Roli Jayawardena. He was my warden in, in the medical hostel. He was my mentor, and he didn't spoon feed us. He taught us to think. And he said, young, think, do not be spoon fed. And at an early stage, he told me, Siri Kanagra, you must get out of this place. I said, sir, do you hate me that much? He said, no, no, for you to prosper, 
you've got to get out of this place. And I, I left early. I didn't even do my internship. But I, when I went to, when I came overseas, the Sri Lankan degree was recognized, whereas degree from north of our country were not recognized. We were quite, they were quite happy to have something like, I was in New Zealand for five years, six Sri Lankan graduates, and, and nobody from up north. When I say up north, the north country. And that is the recognition. And we were, proud. the way we were taught to examine patients, the way we were taught to talk to people, the empathy that we, we had for our patients, the things that our teachers in our medical school gave me, and I value it. And I, I knew to, to be grateful to the place. I continued to, to help. I have taken over graduates from there, registrars from there, and tutored them here and sent them back. As Vajira said, I've played a part in starting your uh, sports medicine um, college going, and I have continued to be of assistance to those people. So I, for my little success that I have had, would, uh, would say thank you to this medical school that gave me. It was a Ceylon medis medical school then. Um, I think I must be the only uh, member of this panel that got out of Ceylon Medical School. All the other guys, including young Dushanta, are juniors. And so it was Sri Lankan Medical School. And so I, I must say, um, I, I thank you. And may I say um, great thanks to my teachers, to my ex-teachers, and may the college flourish for another 500 years. Thank you, Vajira. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Kanhangara, for those words. Now let's move on to our next um, speaker, Professor Maheshan Nirmalan. Professor Nirmalan is um, Vice Dean for Social Responsibility at the Faculty of Biology, and Medici Biology Medicine and Health at the University of Manchester. He is also the Professor of Medical Education and Consultant in Critical Care Medicine at the Manchester Royal Infirmary. Infirmary. He led the group responsible for revamping the entire clinical curriculum and introducing e-learning to enhance the learning experience of over 1,500 students each year. He also introduced mandatory minimum standards for all undergraduate clinical placements in Manchester and um, in Lancashire. Over to you, uh, Nirmalan. Thank you very, very much. Can you hear me, Vajra? Is that, is that all right? Is the sound yes. okay? Yes, oh, loud and yeah. clear. Thank you. Uh, the, the Vice Chancellor, the, the current Dean, the past Dean, my most respected teachers. Uh, I think a future historian recording the history of these days that we are living in is sure to look at uh, the history as before Corona and after Corona. And one of the greatest privileges I have had was to take part in the centenary celebrations, both before Corona and after Corona. Um, Professor Jayavira touched on the foundation that we had, and I just want to elaborate a bit more on that foundation that we had. I think if you go trace the history of medicine from the time of Shushruta and then going through Hippocrates and Galen and then to the modern times, the, there have been predominantly two paradigms which have influenced the practice of medicine. The first one was a reductionistic paradigm where the in, well-being of an individual was seen to be seen through the eyes of the well-being of the components of that individual, whether it is a system or an organ or a tissue, et cetera, a reductionistic approach. In parallel to that, there was another paradigm, which was a more holistic approach, which looked at the individual as an integral component of a system, and the well-being of the system was related to the individual, and the well-being of the individual was related to the well-being of the system. And what was unique about the foundation that we had in Colombo was that it brought in both those paradigms, directly or indirectly, into our learning and thereby gave us a very wide foundation. Now the foundation was not only wide, it was sufficiently deep. I'm sure all of you know the depth 
to which our, our knowledge, uh, the, the, the depth of knowledge that was demanded, the depth of knowledge that was tested, and the depth of knowledge one had to have to be rewarded adequately in some of the assessments that we have had. Okay, there have been issues, times when we had to learn the anatomy of the circumflex scapular artery, or, or you know, bizarre and wonderful things, but it was that depth, which even if with, with an attrition rate of about 50, 60%, still left you with a sufficient knowledge base on which your practice could be based. So we had the breadth and the depth of the curriculum that, of, of, of our profession delivered to us. And more importantly, was the quality of the builder who built that foundation in. My boy, the quality of some of the master builders who we were exposed to by going to that medical school. They were knowledgeable, whether it was uh, Professor Lalita Mendes talking about microbiology or Professor Pandita Ratna talking about uh, the anatomy of structures, the knowledge base that those individuals had was clearly apparent to us, even as the young students who were distracted. The passion with which they communicated that knowledge, uh, where Professor Kamini Mend is talking about the malaria cycle, or, or, or Dr. Kurukula Surya, late Dr. Banti Kurukula Surya, when he talked about the pot shot uh, uh, of, of uh, the comparison between a fibroid uterus and the pot shot, the passion with which they communicated their knowledge, the sense of humor that they brought in so that the lectures were actually fun. And when saying that, I think of Dr. Jerry Jayasekhar or Professor Viswanathan who brought in a tremendous amount of fun into the, into, the, into the teaching class. And the sense of perfection that was, uh, that was expected, whether it was Professor Sharif Dean talking about surgery or Professor Nandadasa Kodagoda talking about how to describe the skull fracture, the level of perfection that was expected of us was phenomenal. And that taught us some lessons. And then perhaps more importantly, the teachers who taught us were not willing to be bystanders in a society and be passive observers. They wanted to say, change society. And when I say that, I think of Professor Carlo Fonseca, Professor Colvin Gunratna, who made a, a sort of a permanent impression on all of us. So in many ways, when we were students at that faculty, it felt in the true sense of the word that we were standing on the shoulders of giants. And now to the question of how that has affected my own career. As a clinical academic, I currently work in one of the largest intensive care units in the Northwest of England. And do, during the COVID, current COVID ep epidemic, uh, every aspect of the training had to be brought out. I led a teaching program where the knowledge base that we acquired and, the, and that foundation I was talking about enabled me to almost very boldly take on things that were way beyond my immediate specialty, uh, revamping the whole curriculum. Uh, and I was confident enough to say that I knew enough pathology, or I knew enough microbiology to write an undergraduate program. I, I didn't say I'm an anesthetist or I'm an intensivist. This is beyond my specialty. I, the, the confidence that it gave me. Uh, and on the research arena, uh, I have had the privilege to work through, uh, through a range of uh, activities, starting from single cell models of oxidative stress to integrated physiology in live animals, to what I currently do, uh, looking at post-conflict disability in, uh, in Africa, and of course, the transmission of uh, COVID virus in the shanties of Northern, uh, in Kenya. So that wide range of, uh, uh, for, portfolio, which I was bold enough to take on. And perhaps most, more importantly, the desire to do things which had an impact on society. And that includes whether my work in uh, some parts of Sri Lanka talking about multilingualism, uh, or, in Kenya, or in Uganda trying to set up artificial prosthetic limb clinics. So these were some of the attributes and virtues that that foundation which uh, Jaya talked about made some of us think. And for that, I am eternally grateful, very, very grateful. And perhaps in my position in Manchester, I have had the privilege of seeing or having glimpses which some of my teachers and my, some of my colleagues didn't have. But I would, wouldn't I? Because I was standing on the shoulders of jams. 
Thank you. Thank you very much. Let's move on uh, to the, uh, um, the second part of the uh, speakers. And I'd like to invite my co-chair, uh, Professor Indika Karunath Tilaka, to um, introduce the next set of speakers. Thank you, uh, Professor Ajira. So uh, now we have discussed about the value of the clinical training and public health. And let's move into a different area. Uh, that's medical education. And the next speaker, I don't think, needs much introduction to this audience. Uh, my good friend, Dr. Dujip Samarasekara. Uh, a bit of formal introduction. He's a director of the Center for Medical Education in the National University of Singapore and has made great contribution to Singapore as well as to Sri Lanka. And, uh, and he has been a great support of the Kalamu Medical School. And uh, more than that, I mean, uh, for me, Dujipa is a personal friend and we have joined medical education together. So Dujipa, over to you. Thank you, Indika. Uh, first of all, let me thank uh, you, uh, Professor Vajira Disanaka uh, and uh, uh, Professor Chandrika Vijayaratna uh, for inviting me uh, to this, particular, uh, this conference. And also I'm, I'm, I feel that I'm privileged and also I'm, I'm, I'm proud to be uh, part of the panelists uh, of this uh, virtual conference celebrating the 150th birthday of our uh, alma mater. So uh, thank you very, once again. Uh, I don't want to go through the same uh, uh, areas that uh, the previous speakers mentioned. I, I certainly agree with them uh, that, you know, uh, that we got uh, an excellent foundation as well as uh, a very good uh, basic science, uh, basic medical education training uh, from, our, from the Colombo Medical School. Um, what, I, what I want to highlight is that Apart from the training that we got in the content areas, the Colombo Medical Faculty also trained us and gave us that training in uh, holistically in many other areas. Uh, all of us getting involved in law medical or uh, in Ninnada or Kalaulelas uh, and even the, the turbulent 19s uh, where we had a uh, uh, lot of internal strife uh, working with uh, different student groups, uh, sometimes uh, even getting involved in violent protests, actually helped mold us to face the, the real world. And uh, this is uh, definitely uh, an attribute that I have, uh, I, I very much like to share uh, that, that we, 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 we all got trained in, especially to, to adapt and to be flexible. And for a medical educator, this is extremely important because we work with a diverse group of uh, people, uh, faculty from many different areas. So to work with them and to achieve a common goal, we need to be uh, very uh, flexible and adapt to the context as well as to different situations. So I'm truly grateful, apart from the solid training that we got, uh, we, were all, we also got exposed to this chaos uh, so that we, 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 are, we, we, we are very adaptable to any situation anywhere in the world. When I come, uh, I just want to also highlight two areas where the Colombo Medical School and uh, the University of Colombo uh, actually pioneered in this uh, uh, region, uh, medical education. First of all, I think in 1960s, uh, when, uh, when the medical education was not even uh, a discipline in many places, especially not in the region, uh, University of Ceylon uh, established the Medical Education Unit at Keradenia and uh, the, the, the doyens of medical education at that time, uh, Prof. Dr. Palita Bekon, uh, Professor uh, Jayakrama Raja, uh, uh, Professor Raja Bandarnaika, uh, took medical education beyond, beyond the shores of uh, Sri Lanka. And I think the second uh, highlight I, I just wanted to share is in, again in 90s, when the Colombo Medical School, first of all, adapted uh, a cutting edge pedagogy, uh, the most innovative, newer pedagogies, as well as the curriculum design uh, to incorporate into or transform its medical education. Uh, led by Professor Lalita Mendes. So um, I, think, I think these are tremendous uh, pioneering efforts of Colombo Medical School, uh, because during that time in 1990s, I don't think anywhere 
uh, in this part of the world uh, that we had any uh, a curriculum at that time, what, what we had in Colombo Medical School. So uh, those are two, two areas uh, I, I just wanted to share uh, how Colombo Medical School has contributed to the medical education world. Apart from this, I think uh, just coming back uh, to what uh, we are now, uh, the, the school and of course, uh, all of you have contributed uh, tremendously to the Medical Education Scholarship of Teaching and Learning through the Asia Pacific Network. Uh, so uh, being involved in the Asia Pacific Network, one of the co-founders, Professor uh, uh, Gominda Ponnamperuma, uh, yourself, Indika, uh, Professor Madhava Chandra Tilaka, uh, Dr. Asela Olupeliava, they have also contributed to the, the region's scholarship of teaching and learning through the Asia Pacific Network and also getting involved for the past, uh, I think 10 years, all of you in the Asia Pacific Medical Education Conference uh, and as well as uh, uh, the, the Singapore, the, the, the National University of Singapore and the University of Colombo collaborating uh, with the Singapore International Foundation uh, to, uh, to work with 10 faculty members and another 40 uh, health professional educators to, to advance the training uh, in, in uh, health provisions education in Sri Lanka. So these are some of the, some of the highlights that I just wanted to share. And uh, again, truly, uh, we all have benefited with the, the tremendous uh, uh, and, and uh, solid training uh, that we all got, as well as the other attributes that we could apply to our day-to-day -day practice uh, in all parts of the world. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dujipa. Thank you for showing how the Kalamu Medical School has uh, influenced the whole world and the region in the field of medical education. And uh, from medical education, we'll be moving to another pioneering area where Sri Lanka has made a lot of pioneering efforts, that is rational use of medicine and essential medicines. And uh, next speaker, again, I don't think needs any introduction to this audience, Professor Krishanta Virasurya. Thank you very much, Indika. I assume you can hear me. Professor Virasuri, your sounds are not clear. Um, can you hear me now? Yes. Is it better? Now we can hear very clearly. Yes. Yes. Thank you very much, Indika. And it gives uh, me a great privilege and honor to address this audience on the 150th anniversary. The anniversaries of the faculty have actually been a part of my life cycle. I was a student in the 100th anniversary, a professor in the 125th anniversary, and an emeritus professor in the 150th anniversary. And I just wondered what it would be on the 175th anniversary. That is for the future to see. It gives me enormous pleasure and encouragement to see a few of my teachers and many, many more of my students who are teachers now uh, in the audience. I think we must have done something correct if we were able to inspire these people to carry on and to be teachers in the faculty and to continue our tradition. As Indika mentioned, my focus today is on the influence of this faculty on global health, rational use of medicines, and what have we achieved in universal healthcare. We stand, as Professor Nirbalan said, on the shoulder of our great giant, Professor Seneca Bibile. Professor Bibile developed the Ceylon Hospital formulary in 1959. And this practically meant that the healthcare system in Sri Lanka had effective medicines which were bought affordably. The World Health Organization developed its essential medicines concept and the list in 1977. And Sri Lanka was mentioned as one of the three countries which had implemented the concept. At that time, not in name, 
but in principle and was successful. Today, 150 countries have national essential medicines list. Think of the beginning of the Ceylon Hospital formulary in 1959 that covered maybe 6 million. Today, 150 countries probably cover more than 5 billion of the 7 billion in the world. A, a seed that was planted that has had an explosive global effect. It's not only in medicines that this is important. It is for the whole healthcare system. As the previous speakers have mentioned, our jewel in the crown is our universal healthcare system, available to all, free and when necessary. It had no limitations or barriers. Many countries have tried this, but have not been able to sustain it. Sri Lanka succeeded. Why? One of the reasons was the major impediment of unaffordable medicines did not exist. We selected medicines and provided it carefully, which meant the system could be sustained and could go on. Bhutan, a country which has followed the essential medicines, is a similar example. One can think of other countries which have followed and the essential medicines which was poo-pooed by the high income countries is now being brought back in principle, even in the healthcare systems of those countries. We were taught by the best and practiced the best. We were taught by Professor Lionel, Professor Kortegud. We had clinical trials in the 1970s as a lecture very unusual for our undergraduate medical curriculum. May look esoteric for you, but that is the beginning of evidence-based medicines. Critical thinking that allowed us. Our teachers told us that when we chose a medicine, these were the reasons, which we then carried on. Today, not a single child in Sri Lanka, I must say, I'm sorry, Today, all children in Sri Lanka receive appropriate medicines for diarrhea. Not a single child receives inappropriate medicines. Why? Because inappropriate medicines like chalk and opium and etc. have been taken out of the formulary in Sri Lanka. Why did we do it? We were encouraged by our teachers to follow the science. And it is because of that, we are able to present to the most defenseless of our people, the children, the best we can do. Rotavirus is advocated for children for diarrhea. Sri Lanka does have nothing to do with it. Why? Because diarrhea isn't that much of a problem. We don't have a morbidity and mortality. So it is not a question of simple science, but it is also a question of bringing a cost benefit to the system, the universal healthcare system in our country. And by the way, our universal healthcare system is from the 1930s. Many think of the NHS UK and others in the 1940s as the beginning. No, Sri Lanka began it in the 1930s and was sustained through the work of essential medicines. The other important part of it is that our teachers taught us our ethics, not only in patient treatment, but in medicines. Go to our department of pharmacology today. There isn't a single calendar or anything from the pharmaceutical industry. We cannot be independent if we take such sources. And it is these ethics that made people think 
that what we were telling them is the truth. And that was inculcated to us from the beginning where it was Professor Bibile, Professor Lionel, Professor Kotegoda, who showed us the way to do this properly. It's not only the question of that we taught the students, but with differences in teaching, we also found that the students taught us. I do remember Professor Roli Jayawardhan having the phrase of Mao Setum, where he says, the teacher teaches, the student teaches the student, the teacher teaches the student, and the student teaches the teacher. Many a time, questions that were asked, which meant that students were not fearful in asking questions, put us in difficult situations, but we confessed our ignorance and provided our answers. And that was an important part, as you can see, of building the boat while sailing. Finally, the journey of essential medicines continues in pharmacology and its contribution to global health. Professor Bibile began the initiation. Professor Lionel was the secretary of the first committee and I was humbly the secretary of the 19th committee, which as a third generation from the department, I am proud of. Our fourth generation continues to contribute. So therefore, in conclusion, the foundations that were laid by the faculty are still with us today and will continue into the future. We achieved because of these foundations and have continued to lay the foundations for the future generation, not only for the country, but also for wherever they are in the world. Thank you. Professor Virasuri, again, thank you very much for making us motivated as usual, and uh, that has been your style. Now I would like to invite uh, another young, but uh, someone who has reached, again, great heights, Dr. Padmini Ranasinghe. Uh, she's from uh, United States of America, and uh, she's as his associate professor in clinical medicine, as well as interest in public health. Or to go, Dr. Padmini. Thank you, um, Indiga. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay, great. Yeah, so um, I don't have any prepared remarks, but I'll um, I'll go over uh, what I do here and how some of them have been shaped because of my past experience in medical school. So I'm a part of um, like a mega batch. So we had uh, 250 students then. So I don't want to um, go over to say like the how the foundation of medical knowledge I received in the medical school has shaped me immensely here. That's actually that, as you know, medical, clinical actually um, content has changed over the years. Yet the foundation, what is important, what physiology, pathology, the basic knowledge actually goes with us. So those are critically important lessons I learned. And then other important thing I learned in the medical school helped me is like the discipline. So you get to work with certain group and then you just need to show your discipline and then if you want to go to a higher level. And then other concept I think I want to bring up is the culture. In our medical school, yes, it's going through medical school is not easy as you know, right? Like it's just hard, but the culture, positive culture within the school actually is very important to prevent like burnout and all things then now coming up. So, and the solidarity. So those are the things I think, I think we are, we should be proud of. And then I think in Sri Lanka is unique, the compassion part. Doctors are not only like, okay, be treating patients, they are 
the compassion and as healers, as um, uh, William Oslov, where I work, like Johns Hopkins said, like in the long time ago, I think doctors are healers, right? Whatever the medicine you do, sometimes it's just more important how you talk to the patient. So we learn those kind of skills at, at the basic level when you're in the medical school. Those are critically important. And then the resilience, right? Like when we go through difficulty, we may have bump on the road, like in exams or anything. Yet we go through that because of that, like the, the group and the culture and the school provide you that foundation. And then I, I couldn't agree more with the role models we had during our medical education. Like some of them were like um, Dr. Veera Singham, right? Like really tough, but then you learn from them. And then one person I would like to mention in addition to so many over there, past deans, Professor um, uh, Chandrika Vijayaratna, and then um, uh, Professor Vajira has been dean, and um, uh, Professor Jennifer Pereira. So I worked under her as a demonstrator. So during that time, I learned to do some research. So and during medical school, we try to get through the exam and learn the basics, but then also during that time. So that immensely helpful for me as, a, as a, somebody who works in preventive medicine and internal medicine right now. So, um, and then the other, other important lesson I learned is sense of no boundaries, right? Like when you learn in some areas, you feel like, okay, you are locked into some, but there are opportunities we could see like, you can develop, this is a lifelong, lifelong actually discipline that we are in. We just need to continue to learn. Medicine changes such a rapid space. Sometimes we are behind, so we just need to do that. And then as you know, I'm in um, US healthcare system. I'm at Johns Hopkins School of Medicine as a faculty member. So I teach medical students, residents, and then also I see a lot of patients. So, I, I can relate the cultural differences we have and the system differences in terms of education and the clinical care. I mean, there are a lot of positive thing in both systems. And then I think uh, the, what is what I can go back is like the fundamentals I learned, I can apply here, although a lot of changes that I use right now. And then other important thing I would say, like I, I was not a leader in medical school in the mega batch, but now I'm actually very active with organized medicine. I'm not saying because like it's just to show that, but I think the foundation that created me say we can go to certain levels. So I'm active with the American Medical Association. I'm on a council. Um, I was elected to be on the council. And then also I'm on the board for local medical society the purpose of getting involved is to shape them how our system should evolve. I think um, Dr. Um, previous speaker mentioned um, how the universal healthcare has some, like a lot of positive things in the own systems. I, I really agree with that, but the, you could see what has happened to US healthcare system right now, like even with the management of COVID. And then it's just, it just became so chaotic because of like how some of the things are negatively affecting healthcare in general. So purpose of getting in more in organized medicine to see if there's anything I could be part of changing the healthcare system in such a way health policy level. So I did a residency in internal medicine and preventive medicine with the public health masters. So, my interest right now is to um, create a culture, even when I work with the medical students, like this, um, we need to treat like a holistically the how the system can be changed and also should be available to the patient, you are right there mindfully. So in conclusion, I would say, yes, um, our medical school is very unique providing the fundamental knowledge but then also there are unspoken like nuances, knowledge, culture has provided us without our major knowledge, getting them provided a shaped us in such a way we could be leaders in many dis different disciplines or even um, systems or organized medicine that we chose to. So looking forward to um, our school next century, 
I'm glad that school is taking leadership in advancement in medical education, as well as research. I think um, school has a lot of potential to develop more innovations in public health and um, and like a, you know, because of the national healthcare or like the public um, healthcare system we have. So um, I'm eternally grateful for all the teachers and this, what school has provided me. Um, I truly like to see in during next many years um, to it is getting even to a higher level within the world. So thank you very much. Thank you, Padmini. And uh, now we are moving to the next speaker. That's uh, Professor Suranji Senaviratna, uh, who is uh, currently a consultant in clinical immunology and uh, is working at the Clinical Immunology and Allergy at Royal Free Hospital and at the University of College London. And he has a lot of publications to his name and uh, done a lot of work related to clinical immunology. Uh, over to you, Professor Ranjit. Okay, th thank you. Uh... Thank you, Indika. Thank you very much for the invitation. Congratulations, uh, Vajirat, uh, on your election as dean. Wonderful. Look forward to working with you. And I know you will reach high standards and high levels. Excellent. Very well done. And uh, hello, Madam uh, Chandrika, one of my teachers. It's really nice to see so many of my teachers uh, in the audience. Uh, uh, they are, and uh, they are the ones who built us up, who molded us, as, as people said, molded us to be what we are now, to be, to in addition to the academic work, to be able to take on challenges and deliver on it, to be flexible and to work in teams, to be able to deliver what we take on, not to look back, but always look forward that we can achieve what, what we want to achieve. And there are so many teachers that we have to th thank and the Institute for doing this. There's one person that I really want to uh, single out from, from many people, I can't name everyone, is uh, someone who has been my mentor right throughout medical faculty. And that person was also a mentor to the present dean. And uh, that is none other than Professor Rohan Jayasekar, who the number of letters of uh, sort of reference he gave me right throughout my career is just enormous and thank you very much for all that in addition to all thanking you know, all the medical faculty uh, staff who, who molded us to come into this situation now a lot of doctors and professors have moved from sri lanka to work in the uk and they have thrived in all the specialties they worked in medical, surgical, obstetric, pediatrics, you name it, they have been psych psychiatric, et cetera. They have been thriving, excelling in the NHS system, in the university system. And that was a lot to do with the grounding, the overall grounding, which a lot of other speakers have spoken about that they received while they were students at the faculty. The apex body of medical, the doctors in the UK, the SLMDA, which is led by Tushara Rodrigo, who was a staff member at the faculty. And there are many, many council members who are from the Colombo Medical Faculty. And they have been liaising very closely with the Colombo Medical Faculty and supporting all faculties and including the medical Colombo Medical Faculties a great deal to take on the work forward, which an important thing to remember is the medical faculty has given us all that it could do when we were students. And now it is our time to not look and see what can the medical faculty give us it further. It is our time to look and see what, what can we give back to the medical faculty in whatever way we can do, how can we provide something back to the medical faculty because every bit of help or every bit of sort of expertise would help to get this to even greater heights in the future. Now, collaborative working is very important, working in teams. You cannot do things in, in isolation. Now, specialism is so much, we have to work in teams. And that is what the Columbia Medical Faculty is so 
well versed in teaching their students. We can work across the areas uh, with so many different peoples and Kalam Medical Faculty at the moment collaborates with universities in Oxford, Cambridge, Manchester, Birmingham, London, etc. in trying to get this process out further. When bringing back into my specialty, clinical immunology, which I really want to have taken a liking and so many uh, uh, encouragement in this field, uh, in this field from Sri Lanka, and thank you very much for that. When looking at clinical immunology, it's one thing that is important to remember that five clinical immunologists at the moment in the UK of the 30 or 40 that are there are from the Colombo Medical Faculty. And that is one specialty that a lot of people are from the Colombo Medical Faculty. And, and that, that's something to, to know. And finally, I think the important thing to consider in the next 25, 50 years of the faculty is we can take a lead. We should work together in teams, using all our expertise, help the staff, sorry, uh, join with the staff, uh, working and bring it, have a team effort to understand problems that are occurring in Sri Lanka, the diseases that are, that are present in Sri Lanka, the infectious diseases, et cetera, communicable disease, uh, diseases and non-communicable diseases because using that expertise we can combine our skills to be able to work out why is that cause and secondly how best it should be treated so thanks again to the medical faculty for all that it has column medical faculty that all that it has given per, me personally thank you to all my teachers and special mentors and thank you very much to indica uh, professor indica professor uh, Vajira and Professor Chandrika for all for inviting me to speak here and to say a few words. Thank you. Thank you very much. So we've had a you know a round of uh, speakers from Australia to US um, talking about their experience. Uh, we had senior, very senior colleagues as well as. Uh, uh, mid-career and so uh, colleagues as well. So we've got a, a set of young um, uh, respondents uh, and not um, mid-career respondents uh, who are there uh, joining us on the call today. Uh, let me uh, first invite um, Dr. Ch uh, Associate Professor Chintika Balasurya. Uh, Chintika was a contemporary of um, myself and uh, Indika uh, in medical school in the 1990s. And uh, so over to you, uh, Chintika, to make some brief remarks. So Chintika's background is also in medical education. Thank you very much, Vajra. Uh, thank you, Vajra, and thank you, Indika, for this invitation. It's an absolute pleasure to be speaking at this event today. Um, let me start by acknowledging uh, our Vice Chancellor. It's wonderful to see you there, Madam. Uh, the dean and the former deans. Um, it's just fantastic to cast my eye around the audience. We get a bit of a glimpse. Uh, and it's a very emotional day for us as we look at um, this historic day and we see all the familiar faces in the audience. So thank you once again for allowing us to be a part of this. Um, so I'm joining you today from Sydney. Uh, so I've been at UNSW Sydney for the last 20 years. Um, and it's been a long 20 years since um, I left Sri Lanka, but it's been an amazing journey. And um, I can only echo the sentiments that have been expressed by my dear colleagues who went before me, who've talked about the base that the Colombo faculty gave us and how much we value that sense of grounding that set us up to uh, do some interesting things around the world. I know lots of others have done wonderful things. Uh, so I feel a real sense of pride when I look at all of our fellow alumni spread all around the world doing wonderful things and bringing great uh, pride to our country. It, it, we really are, we do feel really proud to be Sri Lankan doctors and the reputation that our colleagues have brought us um, all over the world, and I can speak uh, very much so 
for Australia, um, we do feel quite a sense of pride to say uh, where we graduated from because the quality of that education has brought a wonderful reputation for Sri Lankan doctors. So my thanks to to the to the first to say a few words today. I thought long and hard about what I would say and what would be most appropriate. Obviously, I want to keep it as short as possible, but I can't help but speak a little bit about my passion, which is my passion for medical education. We look to the future and we get really excited by the possibilities of the future and what the future holds for us. And looking at the literature, we think that okay, there are some key features, some key principles that we can build on like taking humanistic approaches to patient safety, like early exposure to patient-oriented integration, responding to community needs, showing respect for diversity, and of course, taking student-driven approaches and technology-led approaches that would take us into a new and exciting world. So as we look at those principles, I, I reflect on what Colombo is and what Colombo um, gave us. And I can't help but think that we have a wonderful base to build from. There's always more to be done, but I think the base that we have at the Colombo faculty is just absolutely fantastic. And we are uh, in a fortunate position to really build on that base and incorporate some of the new principles into what we do as we move into the future. And there's no better time as we look at this, as, someone, uh, as we talk about the post COVID era that is about to be upon us uh, with a vibrant new leadership taking over, there's no better time than to look at ways in which we can really build from that base that we've built over 150 years and ask some difficult but interesting questions about where we want to go and what we want to become. If I had the luxury of time, I would speak about some of the amazing educational innovations that are unfolding around us, especially in response to these um, unprecedented times. Um, I could speak about the amazing achievements of the Colombo alumni who are around me at the moment in Sydney. Uh, but as I said, I want to keep it as short as possible. But um, so I'm going to say, let's maybe focus on a couple of things. Firstly, if we were to look at the future and if we were to look at solutions that would help us to be, take our rightful place as a leading world uh, school of medicine, what would those initiatives be? And today is clearly not the day to look for solutions, but maybe it's the day to trigger some questions. And so maybe this is the right time as we reflect on 150 years of fantastic achievements. It may be also the right time to ask some questions that will take us into that exciting future. Um, I must, I feel I must end by reflecting on a critical question, one that most of the speakers before me have touched on before. And that is that the faculty has done so much for us. What can we do in return? I have the privilege of being here in Sydney with five of my closest colleagues from the Colombo Medical Faculty. So I've got Randolph, Sajiv, Sanjay, Dushan and Anupa um, within a few minutes of me. And that's an unspoken benefit of being an alumnus of the Colombo Faculty. We've always got someone um, an alumnus, uh, uh, someone we studied with wherever we go in the world. It's quite an amazing feeling to have a family away from family. And that's another un unspoken benefit that the Colombo faculty has brought us. I think I'm going to take the liberty of volunteering them as well when I say that if we can be of any assistance at all, we are at your disposal. Uh, just say the word and we will be there to help the faculty in any way that's needed. Interestingly, in this new world, as we stay more apart, we are finding ways to stay even closer together. Um, and today's event is a wonderful example of that, where from all over the world, we have come together. So the 
opportunities to work together across international boundaries are now endless. And I look forward to working even more closely with you as we venture into that brave new world. Thanks everyone, back to you. Chintaka, thank you for highlighting the very important message. The very idea of this conference also to reflect on what the, what the Kalamu Medical School and the faculty has given us and, and what can we do uh, to uh, pay our respect and the pay debt. Uh, and uh, from Australia now, we are moving to another beautiful country that's in the Himalayan region. We have very close contacts. The Kalamu Medical School have very close contacts with Bhutan. Dr. Karma Tenzin is one of our own alumni, and uh, he's at the current is a vice dean education of the postgraduate uh, school of medicine at the University of Medical Sciences in Bhutan. Or to you, Dr. Karma. Thank you, uh, Professor Indika. Uh, firstly, I would like to begin by uh, taking an opportunity to congratulate uh, uh, Honorable Vice Chancellor, uh, Professor uh, Madam Chandrika, and of course. Uh, uh, at the same time, congratulate uh, new Dean, uh, uh, Professor Vajira, and also uh, congratulate uh, the President SLMA, Professor Indika. And uh, moving on, uh, I would like to start by expressing and paying my sincere gratitude to all the uh, professors, all the legends of uh, Sri Lankan medicine, from whom I had the opportunity to learn for almost seven years. Uh, uh, without your guidance, without your mentorship, uh, I wouldn't have achieved what I've achieved so far. Uh, that's what I would like to submit. Uh, just to touch on, I think uh, while, my, uh, while I stayed at uh, the faculty, uh, it was not just uh, education. With the education, I think it was uh, a lot of uh, team uh, effort, uh, a lot of critical thinking, a lot of self-management and leadership. Uh, values were inculcated and uh, you know uh, put into me and these are now i'm finding it it's a, such a wonderful you know both in terms of personal and professional values and for that i am utmost uh, you know thankful and uh, truly truly uh, grateful to uh, all my great teachers and of course uh, i re very fondly remember professor uh, rohan jaisekra and uh, He's, he used to be one of my uh, true role models. I would often look at him and uh, wonder, would I ever become, uh, or just uh, get a touch of him, uh, maybe even if just one person of him. And uh, of course, there were many more uh, professors whom uh, I really had a lot of respect. Uh, just to touch on country aspect, I think I would, li I would like to touch, uh, take two minutes on that. Uh, Bhutan has been one of the biggest beneficiaries and recipient of uh, Sri Lankan medical system. I think uh, nearly 50% of our doctors currently working in Bhutan in the last 10 years have been actually uh, graduates uh, from Sri Lanka. And out of that major, major number actually is from Colombo faculty. And uh, even some of our postgraduate doctors actually have come through the ranks uh, from uh, our faculty. And uh, these doctors are doing wonderful service uh, to the country and uh, the health systems in Bhutan. And uh, they do it with utmost uh, dedication and of highest standards. And at this point, the doctors and the graduates, especially from Colombo faculty, is regarded as one of the best cohort of doctors Bhutan and the health system in Bhutan has ever seen uh, in last 10 to 15 years. For that, again, my utmost gratitude and a lot of uh, you know, sincere thanks on behalf of the people of Bhutan, on, people, on behalf of our government and the king himself. Now coming to uh, the impact, coming to you know, what uh, uh, we are doing, what I'm doing because of all these uh, values, all these cultures that I've learned. I mean, particularly for me, Sri Lanka was uh, uh, was the first foreign country I ever had an opportunity to visit as a student. So I spent nearly seven years plus, and then there I had a lot of cultural enrichment. And to me, I even now, I always consider Sri Lanka as 
a second home and even given an option i would always you know go back and spend a lot of time in sri lanka and i have a lot of wonderful friends with whom i still have contact even after 15 years of my you know graduation from there uh, just to move on on uh, the highest standard that i learn i pray my stay we are trying to replicate it because i work in a very new university of just 6 6 years and the culture i think i learned one of the best culture i learned uh, in sri lanka i can say was through uh, though initially it looked like a very boring class most of us would go to sleep but then when i really realized one of the highlight for me as a student was uh, the behavioral science stream i knew most of the students used to sleep but this where the highlight which when i graduated and i was posted in one of the remotest districts in bhutan and there uh, what i saw was that the clinical aspect the real clinical aspect did matter but the small values small tips the the, the tricks we learn learn in behavioral science actually made a lot of sense and uh, this was again you know one of the uniqueness uh, which is there only in uh, kalambu faculty uh, and this is something that i as a wise dean now have worked with professor saroj jayasinghe my again immense thanks and gratitude to professor saroj for coming to bhutan we are seriously looking at it has again uh, very well received and all you know even the, the the government level itself they are saying that this is something that we must look at when we are planning to start with medicine uh, the undergraduate mbbs again we are looking at closely and we are again going to you know come to you again you know. okay yeah thank you again dr kharma and uh, it was really nice listening to your fond memories of sri lanka before we move into the next presentation i would like to hand over the discussion to the dean professor wajira and uh, professor chandrika vijayaratna the vice chancellor uh, to get the audience involved because you may be having a lot of comments you made about the presentations and the discussion from your colleagues and the students as so we thought we'll break the monotony of listening uh, and uh, take a few questions uh, from the uh, um, panelists here or anyone um, uh, on uh, on chat who you can uh, send questions um, uh, so the let's move on to some questions from the um, in house uh, audience that we have here any reflections on uh, what was mentioned by our um, graduates and alumni around the world Prof. Saroj Jasingha, would you like to take the lead? Thank you very much for putting me on a spot. <laughs> <laughs> I think uh, we have to reflect on uh, what we have achieved uh, and also now take this opportunity to think of the future. Uh, and uh, I think what, is, uh, what would be challenging to us is how do we reach global heights? And uh, what's the plan we have? to really be a global university uh, shift from merely teaching and churning out medical students to which is very important but i think uh, uh, towards more innovation more research more creation of knowledge and global leaders in uh, in education so that's uh, probably a question for the panel <laughs> May I request uh, <laughs> Professor Vijayaratna to uh, respond to that? We had a wonderful uh, session, uh, Madam, last year at the uh, uh, at the um, uh, University Research Symposium, uh, which you organized. Uh. Uh, thank you for that question, Saroj. But the question was, how do we go global, and how do we convert from being merely churning out doctors to being more research oriented and innovative? now i think we cannot forget that we are producing medical doctors and we cannot just say research and start running 
towards innovation, which we think is probably inanimate. I mean, I'm not saying that there aren't innovations that are very humane. So that I thought I was very struck by the Bhutanese, I believe he's one of our students, yes. and we really ought to have a separate Bhutanese alumni because they, are, they have the highest happiness index in the world, I believe. And for him to have uh, sort of identified that what has had the greatest impact as a doctor and as a leader out there is the behavioral sciences stream, which has been not had a very easy ride from what I remember. Madam uh, Lalita would remember, I mean, to get the social basis of medicine going uh, was pretty tough from the very, very traditional uh, medical curricula that we were used to. But having said that, the fact that we need to inculcate um, analytical thought processes and uh, critical thinking was also no doubt an objective. And I remember uh, Jaya said, mentioned this, that uh, he, he developed it and it was inculcated from medical school days. And to move from being just transferring knowledge and skills to becoming a more research innovative, I think is the need of today. I'm sure the COVID response showed it from starting from a student to even a non-academic producing a desanitizer from this faculty in as much as the fact that we are not really having interfaculty collaboration is something that I'm observing from the other side. For example, science faculty and medical faculty should be more intertwined. Let's forget going global, just let's think of our university. So similarly with the humanities, and therefore, I think we have a uh, much to do. And uh, like what our medical educationists have, are thinking of, I think we need to think more, not only globally, more practically for today's need. And of course, no doubt now the Corona uh, epidemic has, or the pandemic has also made us realize we have to go online, get out of the classroom, the traditional classroom, and probably give more valuable time for our student interactions for something more than just one way information. My take on what I was, have been listening, uh, hearing from the alumni is that uh, we've got a um, training program in our faculty, which is globally validated, uh, you know, from Bhutan in a mountainous place in Bhutan to the um, high tech uh, environment in US or UK or Australia. Uh, our, we are producing uh, graduates uh, who are able to function um, in any scenario across the globe. Uh, so we've, um, uh, so we've got to, as you also saw in those presentations, uh, different aspects of the curriculum were highlighted by different people. So that's also um, a quick cue that we should take from because. Uh, we are, uh, what are the strengths in our curriculum which make them function in those setups uh, in an effective way? And then, of course, um, moving forward, um, obviously, uh, you know, there's research and innovation uh, which everybody is striving for, uh, but um, that has to be done in a, uh, in a context, uh, I, I believe, uh, you know, the society at large benefits, not research for the sake of research or innovation for the sake of innovation. Um, uh, a bit, but of course, uh, you see, when you move into research and innovation, there, is, there should also be the avenues for commercialization and so on. So that is a fundamentally different, uh, you know, uh, approach that we need to take and that we cannot, um, you know, um, I've been always mention, uh, saying this in, our, you know, outside fora uh, with the government and so on, we cannot uh, do research and innovation if uh, the industry out there is not ready to take on those innovations and commercialize. Um, so we've uh, got to move our entire economy into a, uh, into a you know, innovation-based, uh, you know, product, uh, um, in economy. Um, and unless that done, uh, that is done, there are lots of innovations that would just stay there. 
um, that's um, been seen uh, with a lot of innovations that have even won international awards in our country, um, uh, which have never gone to industrial scale. So it's a, you know, it's a journey. And um, uh, the vice chancellor would, um, uh, you know, back me up on this. So we've, uh, done, uh, you know, the university is now in the process of setting up the University of Industry uh, Innovations, uh, you know, um, UBL. collaboration, UBL, yeah. uh, um, uh, University uh, Business Linkage uh, Cells and so on. Uh, but again, uh, while we, you know, move towards, uh, uh, more, move towards that direction, we should also not, um, again, uh, you know, uh, lose sight of the basics. I mean, that's what Corona has shown us. Like, I mean, if you don't have the basics, uh, you are nowhere. You know, I think the strength of uh, strength that we had in Sri Lanka was that we had our basics right. And um, so basics of public health, basics of clinical um, medicine um, need to be in place while we, you know, move into, um, uh, if you want, a more innovation research and R&D and innovation based uh, approach. Professor Vajira, I think, thank you. And uh, uh, we are getting some requests from the audience that they want to make some comments. Amod, can we allow some of our participants? We also have, um, while those um, participants online are uh, enabled, we also have um, a professor, um, uh, Ravin Hangwell, who put his hand up uh, in the yes, audience. Yes. Uh, and uh, Prof. Ravid, yes. Just a few comments, really, Vajira, not a question. The faculty may not know that I was the first lecturer in the behavioral sciences. It was called the, I was the lecturer in psychiatry and clinical social sciences. That was my title. <laughs> Professor Mendes was a very enthusiastic pioneer in the changing curriculum movement, as I can call it. And when I joined the department as a secondary registrar, he said, OK. I will take you to the department on one condition. You have to do both psychiatry and teach this new thing called clinical social sciences. <laughs> so obviously I said yes. And in 1990, I joined the faculty and I had this one hour on Thursday morning where I taught the students the wonders of the doctor-patient relationship. So that was the beginning of the behavioral sciences. I think faculty may not know this actually. <laughs> and then later when I came back from the UK, Professor Lalita Mendes was the dean and uh, Behavioral sciences was in kind of starting, but then I was not very happy with the curriculum. I wanted to do the changes in the communication skills. And Madam Lalita Fernando, uh, Lalita Mendes, sorry. She, I said, okay, what do you want to do? I said, I want to go to Oxford and they have a wonderful program there. Can I go and have a look and come back? And can I have some money? And Professor Lalita Mendes said, okay. And he gave, she gave me $2,500 and said, don't tell anybody. Have a good time. <laughs> Uh, and that was minus the airline ticket also. So anyway, <laughs> so I went to Oxford and three weeks, studied the program, came back, and that's when we started the communication skills program. And one tangible thing that came out of it, and that's a good trace actually, what one, what teaching can do to the entire country. I brought back a, a breaking mo bad news model called the Spikes model, Robert Buckner. <laughs> And this I taught to the entire faculty many years ago. And now all the students, alumni of this medical faculty know the spikes model. And I know how to distinguish a Colombo alumni from a non Colombo alumni. I asked them, do you know the spikes model? If they say no, no, then they are not from Colombo. And they all know it. So that's been wonderful. So it's actually teaching can make a difference. And this is a good tracer because I know I brought it and now everybody knows it. And for the future, I have a few plans. I will not waste time here telling you, but there's a little problem in the faculties uh, all over the world. What we are noted is that after the third year, the students lose their empathy. They come empathic and they become non-empathic doctors. And that's called the third year empathy drop. It's a recognized uh, problem. And there's one medical school in the U.S. that has actually formulated a program to combat this uh, drop in empathy, and that's been very successful. This is the Jefferson uh, Medical School, and they have a very uh, pro uh, practical program that we can initiate. So I have this idea with Vajra now taking on this new role and Madam Vice Chancellor, whether we can do it in this faculty. It is possible. I will not go into details today, 
But that is my next task for the next 25 years. I won't be there for the 175, but at least maybe we can increase the empathy of this faculty for a start and prevent this empathy drop in the third year, which is a big problem in all medical school. Doctors come in empathy, go out of medical school, non-empathic. That's a recognized phenomenon. So thank you very much. Those are my comments. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you for you. highlighting uh, that very in interesting um, aspect of medical education, which we should, uh, I think, definitely consider. Mm -hmm. Uh, there are some comments coming from the audience also. Uh, some want to make some comments from their end. Uh, if I am to summarize uh, most of the comments, they want to find out how we can make our graduates as change agents to improve the health in the rural areas. If maybe Prof. Larita Mendes or Dr. Kishan, Prof. Kishanta, anyone can answer very briefly? Or Prof. Sarojai Singh? Professor Mendes, Prof, uh, you want to Prof. come in? Yes, please. Uh, many want to find out uh, how we can make our graduates as change agents uh, to improve the health in the rural areas. I think maybe for... Uh, yeah. yeah, maybe uh, more for Krishanth, isn't Krishanth. it? Yes. Yes. <laughs> Krishanth. Actually speaking, that is exactly why we started this uh, community attachment program away in a rural area from Colombo, getting students to at about 10 days out of the faculty, but teaching and learning in the community, working with the community and learning from the community and not from us, to work in the community while working. So looking at the actual situations that they may have to work in the future. So that is where the community attachment program gives some real fundamental training to students on job. So that is one way of doing it. Second one that we are looking at is improving our family attachment program to a higher level to get that skill training, uh, actually st structuring that skills into very small parts and to trying to impart those on students. So those are the two things that we are actually trying at the moment. I hope that it works and we know from our feedback from students for the last seven years that many students have gained certain skills from the community attachment program. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Prashant. And can we also ask the two pediatric professors here? Yes. Uh, because I remember when we were yes. students, that was the exposure we had. Prof. Varnasuri. Back that to look forward. Uh, I must say, the, of all the panelists, only someone who came even close to my vintage was Siri Kanangara, who was one year junior to me, both at Royal and Medical School. Uh, anyhow, looking back, in 1966, when I was a fourth year medical student here, it was Professor Earl Fonsek and Professor Priyani Soiza who started the family attachment program. Uh, we had to visit a family in our community health project area in Piracote during a period of six months. Once a week in six months and then during the professorial appointment, we had to go very regularly and we had seminars here in the public health community room. So that was the first family attachment program. I think that was 52 years before Rome, reorientation of medical education for producing community-oriented graduates, and it was 22 years before the Edinburgh Declaration, which said that the venues for medical education should not only be in a hospital, but in a community. And so the Colombo Medical School initiated the scheme, the family, he referred to the family attachment in 1966. I was in the first group that ever went out there. And then once I qualified, I joined the department, and along with uh, Professor Sanat Lamamal Surya and people, we continued this social pediatric program. And that program has percolated to every medical school in Sri Lanka now in one form or the other. And it has really helped to transform the orientation of clinical training in that we are looking more at the social and the community aspects. As for me, it was a transformational experience. 
and uh, I know that my entire career, although I, it is in a clinical discipline, my focus has been on the social and community aspects. And that was entirely uh, inspired by the training I had. So I'm really grateful to that training and remember it very fondly. Thank you very much. Uh, Professor Lama also would like to make some comments. Uh, can you please? Yeah. Yeah. It's come. It's come. So yeah. it's, it's me. Oh. I think Narada has mentioned most of the things about the social pediatric program. Now, I think you all know that I'm involved in the new medical faculty in Sabaragamu. I've uh, been the consultant for that project. And what I have in mind at Sabaragamu is for about uh, two or four students to be attached to a family from their first year. And then for them to look after that family, until they graduate and to have some supervised visits together with the MOA staff and some academic staff of the faculty uh, and for them to be introduced to the community right from day one. At the same time, because they are going to be involved with clinicals, hospital visits also from the first year itself. So from the first year itself, introduce them to the community as well as to the hospitals. Going to the hospitals is not to examine patients, but to see the setup of a hospital. For instance, the path taken by a patient who comes with a complaint, who is seen at the outpatient's department, and then he's taken to a ward for admission, from where he gets his meals, from the, how the x-rays are done. So something like that. Early exposure and gradually broaden it as they enter the clinicals and also broaden it when they go into the community. So that's what I have in mind for Sabaragamu. Thank you. Thank you very much. Sir. Uh, Saruj. Uh, yes, Prof. Saruj. Uh, yes. Yeah, just to make a few comments. I think some of these we actually had initially in the new curriculum where students uh, went to the hospitals from first year but uh, subsequently we have lost some of those. Uh, I also want to highlight about the Department of Medical Humanities because that's something which was established in 2016. And uh, that was uh, as part of the Behavioral Sciences Program. And uh, we have been pioneers in that. And uh, we are the pioneers in medical humanities in the region. I happen to be the founder, uh, founder head, but now it's headed by Professor Priyadarshini. And uh, we have included, in fact, compassion as uh, one of the main uh, areas from humanities in the behavioral sciences. So we are using uh, narrative-based uh, learning and uh, arts and music in relation to, uh, to develop compassion. And uh, point by Ravin is, Professor Ravin is well taken. I think that's a major problem we have of decline in empathy after the third year and also in the postgraduate years. So we are leading in that also, just to mention. Yeah. Thank you very much. Um, let's move on. Yeah. Uh, let's move. We, uh, maybe we can take one comment from the international audience. Uh, Pamod, can you unmute Dr. Nadaraja who want to make a comment? Yes. Dr. Nadaraja, very briefly. Oh, thank you. I'm Dr. Yogananthan. Uh, I want to just make a comment. It's not clear, the sound, the sounds are not clear. The microphone is not working. I think. Can you hear me now? Uh, yes, Hello? You can. Yeah. Yes. I, I was a college tutor in Wessex Deanery and I shall not comment on the medical school. I was told about before I left, they don't want to producing doctors anymore. They were producing medical graduates and it was up to us to make them doctors. This is the sad state of affairs in the UK now. I'm, I'm pleased to hear Dr. Uh, Professor uh, uh, from Manchester is trying to do that. But I think we, I think I'm a great believer that Sri Lanka produced doctors. The last comment I want to make is uh, evidence-based practice sometimes based on hard evidence. I think we need to combine evidence and tradition. Yeah, what I'm hearing the last few years, past few comments is about our, how medicine has drifted away from tradition. That means we are treating people increasingly as objects rather than people. 
maybe time has come for us to go back on that. So thanks, uh, Professor Jaya Singh, to have introduced medical humanities in medical school. Thank you. Uh, now let's get back to the, the panel discussion. Dr. Charita Pereira, again, uh, another alumni from uh, our medical school. He's currently working in Australia as a senior consultant rheumatologist. Dr. Charita. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm saying hello from Adelaide in South Australia. Uh, I hope you can hear me, uh, Indika. Very clearly, yes. Yes. Uh, it's uh, coming up to 11 in the evening. Uh, I must first, uh, first pay my homage and uh, my gratitude to all the teachers who are here, who has made who we are currently. Uh, there are a lot of things I learned from the medical school, just to go back, uh, previous speakers spoke about the education, the breadth and the depth of the education, the education and the discipline and the commitment that we learned from medical school has worked a long way uh, for us in overseas countries. A lot of the doctors who work in Australia who are graduates from uh, Colombo are well respected and recognized for their knowledge. And I thank all our teachers for that. Something I learned personally, in addition to all of that is also leadership. Uh, I'm glad to see that uh, being part of the student union in my final years, Vajira who was a secretary and Padini and Katulanda and uh, Professor Pushatapattu, they've been following that leadership training that we had at medical students. And that's gone a long way in my career as well, because I do a lot of uh, uh, social work and uh, other aspects of leadership in where I live in Adelaide. My passion is for rehabilitation medicine uh, or subacute medicine, uh, which I've been practicing for the last 20 years. Uh, we are in Australia in a, with a very aging population and it's the same everywhere in the world and in Sri Lanka as well. Uh, geriatric medicine, disability, frailty is becoming more and more recognized in parts of uh, Asia and in Sri Lanka as well. So. That's something I think we should be teaching in our medical school. I'm not sure uh, if it's in the curriculum or not. If it's in the curriculum, I'm so happy. Uh, we are struggling to introduce it in the Australian medical schools. Uh, where I work at Flinders, we have a separate uh, module on uh, subacute care. We call it chronic illness care, uh, where we talk about functionality, disease, how disease affect functionality and independence. Uh, and that's something that's going to be useful in the future. Uh, there's a lot of research into this area. So I would just propose uh, uh, to Wajira and the, uh, the curriculum development at uh, Colombo uh, to look into this. And if there's any help that we can uh, help you with uh, from Australia or anywhere in the world, we can organize that uh, and provide. Uh, that's my brief summary. Uh, I hope that uh, I was there in medical school for the 125th anniversary. I'm so privileged to be part of the same program after 25 years. Uh, and whatever contribution we can make from uh, Australia, we will certainly do. And all the very best to you all. Thank you, Charita. I'm sure you will have a lot of nostalgic memories since you were also very much active as a student leader. Uh, now we'll be moving into uh, product uh, from the new curriculum, uh, so to say, that's uh, Dr. Sujani Vijayaratna, who works in Singapore as the associate consultant in anesthesia. Sujani, over to you. You can share your experience, maybe what you have gathered again from the Kalamo Medical School. Good evening, everyone. I assume my voice is clear. Yes, we can. Hello. Hear. Yeah. Okay. Yes. First of all, thank you very much for giving me this opportunity to reflect on my experience in Kalamo Medical Faculty at this historic moment when the second oldest medical school in Asia celebrates its 150th anniversary. I'm proud and privileged to be a part of this event with my teachers whom I look up to. I have so many pleasant memories of my faculty life where I spent most of my youth. Amazing friends, the best clinical and non-clinical teachers, many concerts, sports events, trips, and a huge number of patients who tolerated us throughout our medical student days. A huge thank you to them for being a part of our training. There are many commendable aspects of our training we received. Firstly, 
on a student-led, student-centered and problem-based learning, which clearly stimulated active learning, critical thinking, which contributed to long-term memory. It was not only the knowledge that made me what I am today, but also the habit of self-learning, which is integral to continued medical education. Adopting myself into postgraduate mindset was quite seamless, thanks to the self-learning experience at undergraduate level. Yes, we were skeptical at the beginning, yet here I am, nearly two decades since admission to medical school, feeling grateful for the solid education we received. Not only in clinical sciences and procedural skills, but also on the strong foundation of basic sciences like physiology, pharmacology, and research, which were immensely useful in my training in anesthesia and intensive care. Secondly, I commend the brave step taken by the faculty to introduce behavioral sciences stream to teach us basic psychology, behavioral elements, communication skills such as handling difficult conversations or breaking bad news, even conflict resolution, and a comprehensive coverage of medical ethics. I would say this paved the way for us to become the strong, confident clinicians and lifelong learners we are today in all medical specialties. Integration of research into the undergraduate curriculum laid the foundation for us to grasp essentials, develop a habit of research and practice evidence-based medicine. It gives me a great pleasure to see my colleagues making strides in research, showcasing their findings at international forums, shaping healthcare systems and medical education in Sri Lanka and all over the world. There are thousands of successful doctors around the world playing key leadership roles during this COVID-19 pandemic, navigating healthcare systems and saving lives thanks to the strong start we had at the medical school. Moving forward, I would encourage Colombo Medical Faculty to continue to invest in research and medical education to further shape the curriculum, to suit the need of the 21st century with the integration of latest technology and concepts. I wish her all the best in preparing future doctors to take up the challenges ahead, and most importantly, to nurture the future leaders which the country and the world desperately need at this juncture. Thank you very much. Thank you, Sujani, and thank you again highlighting how the faculty had trained even to face the current challenges. Now, uh, from Singapore, we'll be moving to Canada. Dr. Priyanjit Piris, again, another primary care physician who has done a lot of work related to COVID-19 in Canada. Uh, he's from Ontario. Priyanjit, are you available? Uh, yes. Yes, yeah, we can see you. Yeah, uh, thank you, Indika, uh, 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 and the Dean and uh, Vice Chancellor, and my dear teachers, my beloved teachers, and thank you so much uh, for giving this opportunity. And uh, when I asked Indika what I have to tell about this, and he said uh, medical education in Sri Lanka and how it helps for global level. So I am practicing uh, as a family physician in Canada for last uh, 15 years. And, uh, and I was trained in McMaster University uh, in Hamilton. Uh, so, what I found is uh, in medical education in Sri Lanka is very uh, powerful and uh, the, the fundamentals are very, very strong. So when I came to Canada, the IMGs are not welcome. IMGs being international medical graduates are not very welcoming. Uh, but um, but uh, uh, I as remembered uh, in 2003, when I came, uh, there are many, many doctors uh, uh, were here from uh, different countries, maybe over 2,000 people, only 50 people uh, taken into the medical systems in Canada. Then out of that 50, there are three doctors uh, from Sri Lanka. I am very happy to tell all of them are from uh, Sri Lanka. Thank you so much for dear uh, teachers and uh, uh, giving a very, very... Uh, 
powerful um, uh, uh, reasoning and judgment uh, of a very constructive medical education. We were exposed to real clinical scenarios. Uh, here in Canada, we are not having much uh, uh, real clinical scenarios for the students. Right now, I work as a, uh, uh, as an examiner for uh, College of Family Physicians, and uh, we always go, uh, give the simulated cases for the students. But here in Sri Lanka, we get a real, real uh, uh, patients, real clinical exposures. And uh, in that way, we get our knowledge, our our attitudes, our skills, and uh, our work ethics. And other very important things in Canada is uh, skills of uh, 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 rhetorical speech and uh, how persuade people. So all all this knowledge we gathered from uh, uh, Sri Lankan uh, education. So and also. I would like to uh, tell, uh, uh, we are very privileged and blessed and fortunate to have a teachers like you guys. And uh, thank you so much. And uh, one point they asking about how we um, get Sri Lankan, uh, uh, Sri Lankan medical education in high in global levels. I think most of the universities here, they do a lot of research. Research is the one fundamental things that they became high in the global level. And I wish all the best to, to Sri Lankan uh, Colombo Medical uh, School and uh, uh, to, uh, uh, to uh, continue this uh, uh, legacy forever. Thank you so much. Uh, I'm from Canada, Ontario. Thank you. Uh now again, we'll move into a, another different area that is how the student activities or maybe the student union activities can help to improve your uh, career or maybe the experience, exposure, so on and so forth. Some, about several years ago, there was a newspaper headline saying Kremlin is against Russian decrees. So we'll invite Dr. Kremlin Vikramasinghe to talk about his experiences. <laughs> Thank you, Professor Karanathilaka, for that introduction. Great to our new team, Professor Ajit Sam, and to the Vice Chancellor as well. Uh, I was asked to speak a few words about how my education helped for the current job I'm doing. I work for the World Health Organization, Regional Office for Europe. So my job is frontline contacting, responding to the countries, 53 countries in our region when they contact us. When we don't have guidelines, we have to provide best available scientifically backed evidence-based uh, advice. Where did we learn the basics of our research? That's from the faculty. Of course, part of the research training was in the curriculum, but what I really want to highlight is how some of you teachers went above and beyond your job description or teaching to give us those skills. <clears throat> when I was in the Students' Union, I used to go to MEDA to take the free printouts and photocopies for Students' Union protest press releases. I think Dr. Dujipa wanted to stop me coming. So once he said, Kremlin, we are going to organize student scientific sessions. Do you want to do a research for the scientific sessions? I was a fourth year medical student, didn't know anything about research, but I wanted to continue going to Medar to take those free printouts. So I said, yes, I like to do a research for the scientific sessions. That's where I learned basics of developing a questionnaire, how to write an abstract, present in a scientific session. So I know you always look for any opportunity to give us, to nurture us uh, uh, with those lifelong skills. And I still use them, not just me. Our team was looking at the uh, research papers came up during COVID-19. And my colleagues were presenting these papers and two papers were from Colombo faculty last week that they presented. One from Dr. Prasad Tatlanda on diabetes and COVID-19 management. Second one from Dr. Anil Jayavadana on uh, nutrition, uh, improving infections and uh, immunity. So it was great to see great page, uh, papers coming out of faculty and also you training us uh, on those research. My second point is on hands-on public health experience. The WHO now has three global priorities. First one is protecting people from health emergencies. 
for me, my best example was from the tsunami. And I can see Professor Lama Batsuri in the audience when we came and asked him as the student union president, sir, can we take students to tsunami affected areas? He said, yes, straight away. I know the responsibility he took to send 300, 400 students on a very disaster area uh, without any facilities. But uh, our vice chancellor, Professor Chanjika Vijayaratna, Professor Rishwi Sharif, they all joined us. They went to places like Muthur, Kenya, by Trincomalee, by boats with us. I know for some of you, it may be a small thing, like this is what doctors do. We go to a, a flood affected area and do a medical camp. But for us, you gave us the opportunity to see public health emergency on the ground. And for me, that really shaped my career to do global health lit and really change our lives. So you had families, you had children, but still you took the challenge to go a few days to these areas with us. So it's, uh, it's meant a lot for us and how you went above and beyond your job uh, to nurture us, give you those opportunities is great. And then some of the training courses that faculty developed in the Karnataka developed a disaster management course. You got students to help you. Now in my job, I have to develop courses to many countries. Sometimes our 53 countries include UK, Germany, Canada, so not Canada, the Spain. On the other hand, Tajikistan, Russia, Kyrgyzstan, very diverse set of countries. But the basic principles I learned from you, how to develop a training course for healthcare professionals, I can still apply from you. My final word is actually a response to Professor Saroja Singh's question. How do we reach global height? I know most of you had insights about from clinical side, but from a global health side, I think the new buzzword I hear is from WHO, agile way of working. They say, we want to make sure our staff can work agile with, with maximum flexibility, less restriction, achieving best results. I'm very confident in working in a hierarchical way because that's where we train. We respect the seniority expected and we know territories. We know if we do something which belongs to the other department, they get upset. So we know not to do that. But when the organization expects employees to thrive in an agile way, we need a different set of skills. So I think in addition to the knowledge, if we can develop those competencies, and help graduates to demonstrate those competencies, I think that will be helpful. That's what I'm trying to learn. And I think that will be useful for the future global health. So finally, thank you to all of you for the opportunity. Great to see many of my teachers there and we are ever grateful for the education we got from the faculty. Thank you. Thank you, Kremlin. Again, you highlighted the importance of the non-formal and informal learning experience and how far those experiences can take you. Now I would like to hand over uh, to Dr. Professor Ajit Disanayaka and uh, Professor Chandrika Vijayaratna to take you to the next maybe 10 15 minutes to conclude the session and get the comments from our audience who are the teachers and the experts. So we have heard from our graduates, uh, and I think uh, there are a real loud and clear messages that are coming through. Um, so um, I was um, thinking how we respond to this. Uh, maybe we'll, uh, we haven't heard from the former Dean, uh, Professor Jennifer Pereira. So to move on to the next uh, set of, um, uh, you know, next round. Shall we have a Dean's round, maybe? Okay, yeah. <laughs> dean's round. Former Dean's round, yes. <laughs> okay, uh, thank you, Vajira, uh, for the invitation. Um, yes, uh, they were very, uh, very interesting remarks by our former graduates, both young and old. They gave us many strong messages uh, about the different uh, aspects of our curriculum, which we didn't see as strengths, but which they have identified as uh, very important areas uh, we may not have actually thought about uh, being strengths. For example, the, uh, the comments about behavioral sciences stream, I thought was very valid. Uh, because, uh, you know, that is something that we have not uh, really uh, harped a lot about, like uh, communicating with patients. But of course, we have taken the lead. I think we should strengthen those areas as we go along. I think it's the right thing that we did by developing a medical humanities department. Now, leaving that aside, uh, we also uh, need to go with the world, rest of the world, that is uh, to take the global leadership in uh, 
uh, research in our research agenda. And uh, that is where we may not have uh, had uh, uh, enhanced uh, areas. And I think the current dean can, that is one of the areas that you said that you would want to develop uh, our strengths in this faculty. Uh, one way that I think that we can move forward is uh, by making it flexible for the graduates to move into research areas by developing intercalated degrees and uh, which we have given thought that is while they are in the medical faculty, if they want to be medical scientists, while not ignoring the fact they can still become medical doctors to make their scientific background stronger by giving them a year of research while they move on, before they move on to their final degree or even afterwards, whatever the method so that we can use to strengthen because our uh, cadre of medical scientists in this country is very minimal. There are basic scientists, chemistry and science-based scientists, but medical scientists are very few in numbers. So I think if we move forward, because we are a medical faculty, if we want to move uh, up in research in relation to medicine, I think this is uh, one area that we should explore on uh, for the future by this medical faculty, by having an intercalated degree where they can get a science-based degree plus a medical degree in addition. I think those are my few comments for the future. Thank you very much. Thank you, Madam. Let's move on to, uh, to uh, Professor uh, 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 Lalita Mendes, who is there. Yeah. Uh, Thank you, Ajita. Now, uh, two aspects, I think, that came out of discussions. One is about rural medicine and the reluctance of some of our doctors to go and practice in rural areas. In fact, students have come to me who said, Madam, I'm posted to such and such an area, you know, I can't go there in a vehicle, I have to walk. I don't have a house, I'm boarded with a teacher. That's the kind of, that's the kind of uh, situation some of them face. So I said, uh, look, can't you make use of that time to study for your postgraduate exam? This, there is a conflict here and which we might be able to resolve by uh, speaking to the director of the Postgraduate Institute. You see, can they give some, some award some marks for postgraduate exams if the person has served in a rural area? And that, that needs health ministry uh, work also some uh, some contribution from them to work out, but I think it's worth working out. The other area I want to talk about is, we are talking about globalization. We have achieved globalization. We have so many of our graduates in very high posts. I can give you examples. I don't want to take time. We also have many of our graduates in middle level posts. So, I'm, I mean, they, they somehow go. And why is it that people like to take our graduates? This started in 1888 with the LMS, Licentiate in Med Medicine and Surgery, which the Ceylon Medical School awarded. Then that was recognized in the UK. So that was the first open sesame for people to get out of this country. Then in uh, 1942, we awarded the MBBS. And we continued, uh, the people liked our graduates because their knowledge was good, they spoke well, and for many attributes. But more recently, why do they like our gadgets? Because they have been put through 
an integrated curriculum. And that is the kind of curriculum that is being followed in many of those countries. So for many reasons, we have got it right. We have marketed our doctors without knowing how we did it. We uh, introduced integrated curriculum without uh, not to market our graduates, but to uh, for our students. But that has helped. That has brought us on par with curriculum and teaching abroad. And one small third point, I don't want to enlarge on it. I've been to Bhutan and it's very nice to feel that most of their doctors have had their training here. Now, what other country would have the privilege of staffing a whole country? Sri Lanka has staffed Bhutan. And I think we have to recognize this. I was in the VC's room when the request came from Bhutan. And I said, sir, it's a nice suggestion. I like to take some of the students. But of course, the fees they pay must come to the faculty. I often tell that to our students. And I said, look, the canteen was bought, made with that money. But leave apart this. The other areas that they find difficulties, when I was at the Postgraduate Institute of Medicine, the boards of study, if the Bhutanese students don't reach a certain standard, they're rejected. Now we are losing out on that. So they go to India and get their postgraduate education. That's another thing we have to speak to with the Postgraduate Institute of Medicine. That is, can you give, because we have trained these people, because we have globalized by staffing those people, can we consider giving them an opportunity without making the difference between 65 and 70 marks, you know? So I think we have made a mark in globalization, in staffing a whole country, in other respects too. I don't want to, you know, I have a lot of names which I could have uh, drawn attention to, but there's one thing also I want to point out that we are talking about medical education. Dujipa Samarasekara, who's heading the medical education unit in Singapore, he had his early training in medical education here before he went to Singapore and New Zealand for a short time. But the other thing is that the staff of our present medical education unit have been invited as resource persons to a number of countries, Japan, Thailand, Indonesia, Malaysia, Singapore, India, Pakistan, Saudi Arabia, Oman, and the UK. This is something we have to be proud of. This comes under the definition of what we call globalization. Thank you. Thank you, Madam. Professor Lamabal Surya? From this side? Yes, I think everyone has been talking about how wonderful our faculty have been doing, both our foreign participants and the local participants. Now I want to start talk about something which is a bit controversial. I want to talk about our university admission system. And according to the present system, because of the district system quota, district quota system, quite a lot of our very bright students who fail to gain entry into the state medical faculties, they go abroad. And I think uh, only a fraction of them return to the country. And that's a huge brain drain of our intelligentsia. And when they go abroad, some of their parents also, who are employed, occupying important posts, 
they also go abroad to be with their children. So it's about time that I think we pressurized the higher authorities to change this district quota system. It's about time. Now our faculty is putting up massive buildings. Surely we can take an increased quota. I think we should take an increased quota of students. And in that quota, I suggest that we have fee-living students, not only from Sri Lanka, but from abroad. Just as much as we cater to Bhutanese, I think we can attract students from abroad as well. And that is not at the expense of slots made available for local students. We can accommodate as much as local students as possible, but also open the doors for foreign students to bring very, very valuable uh, funds to develop the faculty further. This is something controversial, but we should not be sitting and sort of applauding one another and saying how wonderful we have been doing. We have to think of the future. And uh, we have to think very, very hard about changing the, our admission policy. Thank you. Thanks. Yeah. Uh, I think uh, Professor Krishanta Virasuri want to make a brief comment. Uh, okay. And then maybe we can move to Professor Rohan Jai Sekharan. We have the uh, SLMA past president, Dr. Anna Vijay Sundar also, to make very brief comments before we conclude. Uh, Professor Krishanta Virasuri, if you want to make a very, brief comment. Very quickly on the admissions policy, this is a huge uh, situation, which is not only related to the education, but to also our social, our equity policy. The district quota system where you discriminate against people, students with lesser educational opportunities is not unique to this country. Oxford, Cambridge, the high universities simply take students from poor schools and when they graduate, they find that the, those students have earned much more honors than the other students. What we have failed in Sri Lanka is to evaluate this district quota system and to rebalance it. And finally, free education is what has got us here. And we cannot sacrifice that. That is for us our lifeblood. This is our free education, which committed us to providing education on the basis of ability and not on the basis of whether you could pay. And this should remain for another 150 and more years. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Virasuria, and, uh, and highlighting us the importance of the free education and the value. We take two more brief comments, maybe one from Professor Hanjai Sekar, the former dean, and then uh, Dr. Anla Vijay Sundar, the past president of SLMA, before we conclude. Thank you very much for giving me this opportunity. We have, I think, this evening listened to a very broad spectrum of views from globalization to localization. But one fact that I picked up from one of the overseas speakers was, he said, we don't want to produce medical graduates. We want to produce doctors. And I think there's a deep meaning there. Something that has been very close to my heart all throughout my career here is, is that empathy apart, soft skills, communication skills, and that quality of humanness needs to be reinforced still in our graduates. With that in view, I'm sure the behavioral stream is doing a great job and the Department of Humanities, which has been launched now, is doing a great job, but I feel that we need to look at the end product. Because when you speak to patients in society, one thing that they usually mention is that this doctor didn't have good soft skills, bedside manners were lacking, or he was rushed, or he didn't treat me as a patient and a human being. So I feel that we need, Dean, to reinforce that because at the end of the day, it is that 
doctor, that healer, that person with the humanness, with the heart, who is recognized as a good doctor. Skills we have acquired, as Professor Lalita Mendes said, looking at that sample, just listening to that, just a small sample of our globalized experts, it brings tears to my eyes of the caliber of student we have produced, the caliber of doctor. So I feel that we need to focus our attention a little bit more on this other neglected aspect. And that of course means a lot of personal contact with the student community so that we will end up with that great medical graduate from Colombo who will be admired and even adored and held in awe in the future. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you, and Dr. Anla Vijay Sundara, you want to make as a past president of SLMA? Thank you very much for giving me this opportunity. I'd like to congratulate Professor Kandikaiti, also Professor, Lady Vice Chancellor of the Columbia University, to Professor Vajradi Sanayaka, congratulations on your appointment. And I also congratulate uh, Professor Jennifer for all the work done in the first part of the 150th year celebrations. Uh, to Professor uh, Indika, thank you very much for inviting me. And I think it is due to the to your expert IT skills combined with Professor Vajira's skills that you all be able to produce this within a short period of time. Well done. It has been a very great conference. Uh, I would like to add to what Professor Krisanth said. In fact, I was also uh, one of the students who entered in the 100th year. In fact, I was the 100th entrance among 150 batchmates. Uh, professor Krisanth was, became an emeritus professor. And uh, Dr. Dianath Samrasinghe also became professor of uh, psychiatry. He was also one of our batch mates. And I think most of us met our life partners, I think during from our same batch or from batches above or below. And I also met my life partner, Ajitha, who was also a batch mate. So I think not only has the Colombo Medical School given us a great education, also given us a humanist point of view and also helped us in our careers ahead. And uh, uh, I also must mention that uh, during the centenary year, the commencement lecture to us was given, was delivered by the great uh, visionary and great humanist, uh, Professor uh, Sen Kabibile, about whom Professor, uh, our, uh, our friend Krishanth also spoke about. And in fact, during that year, uh, I was invited to deliver the vote of thanks. And quite by coincidence, in the 150th year, I was invited to uh, to, to give the commencement lecture to the new entrance in the 150th year. I think that was a great coincidence. And I'm very happy that I've been able to deliver that. Uh, and also from a personal point of view, uh, I have composed a poem, The Glorious Century of the Colombo Medical School. The Glorious 150 Years of the Colombo Medical School. And with your permission, may I just, it's a long poem, but with your permission, may I just give a few verses of that poem? <laughs> right. right. The year 2020, the 1st of June, heralds 150 years of the Colombo Medical School. The diseased and indeed populated Vanni in the year 1860 gave rise to the medical school in 1870. It was during uh, Governor Hercules Robinson's reign. In the surgical wards of Colombo General, the school arose. The Northern Surgeon, uh, surg uh, surgeon uh, James uh, Lewis became the first principal of the Colombo Medical School. Then it goes on for 30 more years, 30 more verses. And then the final two verses are, the year 2011, the junior geneticist, Professor Rohan Jayasekara took over, came to the fore. He transformed the Department of Anatomy with Professor Vajira as never before. Professor Jennifer Pereira was our Dean at 150 years. And she added four new departments and transformed the medical career. The year 2020, our medical school had reached 150 years, an event of great magnitude that deserved much celebration. The Colombo Medical Congress and the, and the banquet were held with great cheer. But, but sadly, COVID-19 canceled many celebrations, oh dear. In the next century, may our school continue to soar and realize the aspirations of our founders and continue to roar. May our medicos emulate generosity, vigor, and zest. And may our school, by all fates, forever be blessed. Chirang Jayatu, long live.
the Colombo Medical School. Three cheers to the Colombo Medical School. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much. And I think that's a very excellent note to, uh, you know, to conclude this um, uh, conference. And may I, before we conclude, invite the Vice Chancellor uh, to say a few concluding remarks. Thank you very much. I think that was an apt ending to a very interactive and also globally, truly global uh, outreach that we had. And I, I would like to thank the Dean and the organizer, Professor Indika, for having arranged this very innovative, but very timely and time appropriate uh, form of communication and reminding everyone that the medical school remains up and running for probably another thousand years or more. Thank you. Thank you, madam. And may I invite um, um, Professor Indika Kanratilaka to also make a few remarks. Yes, I think uh, we have come to the end of a very interactive and very fruitful session. And I would like to thank many for this very successful international virtual conference. It was only about uh, just two and a half days ago that Professor Vajira, uh, the newly elected dean, asked me, Indika, shall we do a conference? So uh, that was a very uncertain time period with the COVID-19. But then I said yes. And then uh, managed to get the support from the faculty and from the SLMA. And I contacted some of my colleagues, uh, the mega batch, so to say, and uh, Dinil, who is over there uh, with his technical expertise. And everyone really helped to basically to move the mountain and come out with an international conference. And I thank all the resource persons, both the international and local, who agreed to come at a very short notice. I think uh, some were given a notice that is as short as less than one day. So thank you, everyone. And hope you have enjoyed and gained from this session. The idea was reflect upon what our alma mater has given to us, our faculty, and uh, what we can learn from them and, and move forward. And thank you very much. And uh, I thank everyone who participated, including the online. There are many online participants from Facebook as well as uh, from the YouTube as well as Zoom. And uh, once this session is over, there will be an activity conducted by a musical event conducted by our students. That too will be uh, webcasted online. So I invite all of you to enjoy that as well. Thank you, Indika. It was um, around... Uh, 10 o'clock on Friday, when um, Indika called me, I asked him, uh, I told him, come to my room. <laughs> I didn't tell him why. I said, when he came, Indika, you are organizing a conference on, uh, Friday, uh, on Monday, uh, Monday evening. And Indika readily said yes. So thank you, Indika. Uh, I didn't give you a choice, and you readily accepted that. Uh, so that is uh, how this uh, conference uh, came about. Um, along the way, many people contributed. And uh, we are really happy to all the um, international um, uh, faculty that joined this conference. No one said no. Everyone we asked um, said yes. And everybody came together, um, uh, however senior or however junior they were. Uh, and of course, when I reached out to all of you, uh, also giving very short notice as much as not less than a day, uh, you, all of you also uh, came forward. So it's um, that uh, collaborative um, atmosphere uh, that uh, inspires um, me to uh, you know, go on and do more. And I'm, I'm so grateful uh, for, uh, to all of you for having accepted this invitation uh, today and for being here, both virtually as well as in person. And we look forward to taking this dialogue further. This is the beginning of a series of um, such events. And we hope that as we go on, we'll mold our ideas, learn from our past, look at the future, or first of all, learn from our past, reflect on where we are today, and of course, then make plans for the future so that we would become, um, uh, we would um, make, uh, we would become uh, a globally competitive, um, uh, much stronger, as well as um, a much more diverse uh, um, institution uh, in the years to come. So with that, I would like to say thank you very much for being here this evening uh, to the in-house in participants. And thank you very much to all those who joined us. 
and I would like to invite all of you who are here uh, now uh, for a small reception uh, in the senior common room. Thank you.